Sarah, you are muted. Thank you, Kara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gerald Lodesser. I'm the Director of Community and Coalition Initiatives at the Suicide Prevention Center of New York State. My apologies in advance that we did not set this up ahead of time to mute people with the entry tone. And it is our understanding that we cannot go back and uh, rectify that. So unfortunately, as people are entering and or exiting the workshop, that sound is going to be happening. So again, my sincerest apologies for that. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. We have over 700 people registered for this in uh, the series of Helping Those Who Help Others events. In a moment, I am going to uh, make the introductions for our presenters today. Before we get started though, I did want to just pause to acknowledge the uh, loss of Officer Eric Talley and the other nine victims who were murdered in Boulder just the other day. And although the focus of these workshops and related work that the Helping Those Who Help Others Steering Committee is uh, working on in terms of suicide prevention and wellness and resilience among uniformed personnel, certainly the occupational dangers that each of you face as a part of your jobs can very well contribute to that heightened risk and vulnerability for emotional distress and concerns over suicide. So for Officer Talley and your family, thank you for your service. Um, and just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that uh, very recent loss. Uh, before I make the introductions for today's workshop, just a quick reminder, we have to save the date for our next presentation, which is gonna be April 28th from 12 to 1.30. That title is gonna be Cultivating Hope in Caring Communities, All Hands on Deck for Suicide and Gun Violence Prevention, Prevention with uh, Dr. Joe Hunter from uh, VA in Albany and Reverend Bruce Swingle. And that's uh, more information will follow on that. I also want to let folks know that if you're interested, if you're on this call today and you're interested in presenting on a topic that might be of interest to this group in the future, you should have my contact information. Certainly, please feel free to reach out. With that being said, I am pleased to introduce uh, all of our presenters today. It's going to be two separate presentations. Uh, starting things off will be Katie Oldgowski and Officer George Hill. And Katie has been with the Mobile Crisis Assessment Team operated by the Mental Health Association of Columbia Green Counties since 2016 as a psychiatric clinician and is acting director of MTAC since 2017. She's the CISM coordinator for Green County and mental health lead for the Upstate First Responder Support Team and serves on a multitude of committees for both Green and Columbia County such as the Suicide Prevention Committee, Community Services Boards, Mental Health and Oasis Subcommittees, the Columbia Green Addiction Coalition, just to name a few. Officer George Hill, who will be presenting with Katie, has been a member of the Ulster County Sheriff's Office for the past 22 years. He's currently the SISM Team Coordinator. After joining pre-9-11 in 2001, he's an Honor Guard Commander, Dive and Swift Rescue Team member, Opioid Response, as County Law Enforcement or Oracle team member, uh, Corrections, Law Enforcement and Fire Academy instructor, PCJS instructor, previous volunteer firefighter, and an Army and Marine veteran. And once George and Katie are done with their workshop, we will be having John Petrullo, who's a retired NYPD officer and Executive Director for PAPA, which stands for Police Organization Providing Peer Assistance, John has been executive director of PAPA since 1999. And with that, I am going to turn the controls over to Katie and George. And there we go. We'll be ready to go. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> Thank 
Sorry. Started a what's a scrolled in just realize that you're getting a preview. <laughs> All right, so thanks, Kara, for the introductions. Um, we are going to be talking today about the Helping Every Responder Overcome Resiliency Program. Um, it's a program that has been in development for the past two years, and you know we're tentatively going to launch it uh, that fall of this year. Um, some of the things that we're going to cover today are going to just be, we have to pepper in, we know that first responders are pretty good. Funny things in here. So we're just going to cover data, current programs that are out there in our area, the actual Helping Every Responder Overcome Resiliency Program, how does it fit within your agency, and then next steps. So first thing you want to talk about, um, and we know that everyone is pretty educated in this um, group, you know, the purpose of suicide and prevention and so we're looking at just some of the numbers from 2017 2018 2019 um you know as we've talked about on previous you know forums that you guys have been doing this is only a number of suicides you know the firefighter behavioral health alliance who tracks fire ems and dispatch believes that this is maybe 60 percent of the actual reporting and with law enforcement, those numbers are even, you know, more skewed because we're not getting accurate reporting. So if we go to, you know, even the 2020 and 2020 data. The next slide. So these numbers are still pretty high. We're going to include veterans in this as well, um, because those are some of the biggest numbers that we have nationally and there's a lot of crossover between veterans and all of the first responder disciplines so that's a number that we have to look at um, as well all right so when we get actually into um, new york state training that's mandated um, what we kind of found out was there's a lot of lack of mandated uh training um, if you see at the top fire dispatch there's nothing out there right now that mandates to do it i know a lot of agencies throughout the state you know kind of throw in their one hour two hour little chunks but it's really not mandated and that's where we have to come together as a community and start mandating some of these things if you look at EMS, they just recently added one hour of training a year if we get into the department of criminal justice um, you've got 16 hours of officer wellness in the police academy. Uh, police, it's four hours of just mental health. And a lot of times what we notice with the four hours of mandated training, it wasn't for the officer. It was actually EDP subjects, stuff like that. Um, correction, po uh, probation, and peace officer, we really don't have, there's no mandation out there. It is being peppered in, but it's not being peppered in on a blanket um, common terminology type of uh, situation. Right. And when you look at the image on the left, you know, Army, Army, our first responders, you know, specifically law enforcement today with the, you know, tools to take care of their mental health. We arm them for dealing with the public. We arm them for dealing with, you know, bad guys, criminals, you know, but are we arming them with the mental health side of the house? So as far as services, we, we cover really green um, Columbia and Ulster County, you know, so when you're looking at services, I think that this is a very good picture of what we have available. You know, the struggle is that when you go overseas, the first two are really the only things that we have for first responders specifically. There's other great programs, there's other great people who are trained out there, but well, the Ulster County Sheriff's Office Critical Incident Stress Management Team and the Upstate First Responders Fourteen are really the only two that are specific to serving first responders. Um, in this, when this got sent out, there's hyperlinks to all these other programs so you can learn more about them. Um, and just to touch on critical uh, intervention team officers, you know that's something that is great. Um, there is some officer resilience built into crisis intervention team training, um, but those officers aren't. It's not standard across all agencies. A lot of time, the training is five days. It's a lot of overtime and different things like that. So it's just getting information out successfully as well. One of the things I do want to kind of speak about this is the fact that. Um, a lot of times when we throw the terminology around CISM or Oracle and, you know, these different programs that we have, 
Um, I could probably walk down to the hallway and talk to a couple of my guys working on the road or in jail and ask them, hey, what does the SISM team do? What does the Oracle team do? And it's a lack of training on our behalf that we're not actually getting that information down to the operational staff that are working in the street to really understand what is the SISM team utilized for. Um, throughout the years, we've started to see that the SISM team starts to get used for things that it may not be intended for. Right. So what does that say for us? There's not an overall awareness or understanding of all the services provided throughout our regions internationally. We know there's great programs out there. We know there's great trainings out there. Um, but there's just a lack of awareness, you know, and that's the onus is someone on the agency, but also like finding these resources, vetting these resources, you know, that's a task itself. Um, and again, there's no standards for mental health training or, you know, resilience specific in New York State. So this gets into the concept of, you know, what is it that we're actually missing? Um, we've got several programs throughout the state, amazing programs. Um, but it's coming back to the concept of resiliency as a culture. I know that resiliency has been kind of like a buzzword for a few years. It came out of the military up into the FBI, but actually knowing what a resilient culture is and the switch or the change of that. Um, different interagency outreach. I know a lot of times when we first started getting involved in this, we started to look into the concept of, you know, what are the resources out there and who knows what they are? And what agency has his own, what agencies have fear. Um, we're also missing the concept of prevention and post convention, um, post prevention components, you know, before or after what's going on, how are we prepare them, or how are we taking care of them a couple of months down the road. Um, hollow training, I know that sometimes people can take offense to this, um, but a lot of times we do trainings, and in that hollow training, what you're actually looking at is the concept of. We talk about how horrible our job is, and then at the end, we put up, hey, these are the hotline numbers, these are the people you can call. But we actually don't really dissect into what are the resources that you can get. Family support systems, since I've been in the military, I, uh, I haven't heard much. There's nothing in the first responder community. When you look at law enforcement, it's almost non-existent. When you get into the fire and EMS services, a lot of times there are family, but it's not a, an actual family support system. Um, and then the safety net, what do we do at the end result? Um, one thing I do want to kind of point out is that SISM is reactionary. When we look at SISM and a lot of you know, administrations will look at it and say, well, I have SISM peers, but that's a reactive type of program. It's not a proactive program. So the Helping Every Responder Overcome Resiliency Program is to create a sustainable peer program that can be adapted to meet the needs of each and every, you know, first responder and their own agency. There's lots of components that will go over, but the, the goal is that you can take whatever components are going to benefit because something is better than nothing. Um, we want to take all of those great trainings, all of those great resources that are out there and make them available, put them in one spot and train people to understand what the resources are. You know, I, when you look at first responder mental health, we look at, you know, the statistics and how terrible everything can be and, and what we need to do to change it. So, so this is just one of the many answers to do that um, with a command structure. Yeah, it's good that she kind of like mentioned the command structure because um, for years, you know, the dirty word was ICS or NIMS, and a lot of bosses really didn't understand it. But one of the things I'd like to say is when you're looking at the HERO program, what it's actually doing is creating that common terminology. And if you're looking for a peer, you know what the definition of a peer is and what they do. Um, if we can do this as a blanket across the state of New York or the nation, the program itself will self-sustain itself by knowing through common terminology what everything is and identifying it. So when you actually, oh, you want to do this? Nope, you go right ahead. So when you get into the actual components, you're going to be looking at your training. That's going to be initial and your annual. Um, so it's not a one and done type of situation. Uh, your peer support model, that's getting into the prevention, crisis intervention, post-action peer supports. Your family support model, your peer recreation, and looking at the environment. 
Not too many places actually taken into consideration of retirement and what we do for the guys leaving. So George touched on this before. Resilience is a culture, not just retaining. I think or you know, people had looked at resilience as leaving that magic wand and saying, just cool, you have this training to prove you're resilient. But the reality is that resilience isn't just, you know, a training, it's a complete culture shift. You know, the goal of this program, when you look at resilience, like these are the four pillars really of being a resilient person. What does it mean to be resilient? With your mental health, positive thinking, decision making, your rebound, and being very self aware, your physical health, taking care of your physical health, social health, your family supports, your teamwork, and your connectivity, and your connection to the people that you work with. Um, and then your spiritual health. We're not just talking about religion. We're talking about your values, you know, your perspective and, and your purpose. These are all four things that really build the foundation for a resilient person. And the program itself fosters all of these things and gives that framework to kind of, if one of these pillars is, is crumbling a little bit, where can we help fit and fix some of that? Uh, it was, it was funny that you. You know, Katie mentioned the concept of that magic wand. I know a lot of bosses, a lot of administration like to look for what is that? What What is the fix? Um, and I remember bringing up hero resiliency or just resiliency. And I had a lot of administrators saying, oh, we'll send them to resiliency training and then we'll be good. And I, and I actually asked for them to define to me. So well, then what is resiliency? And it was very difficult for them to even dissect that and throw that back out to me. And that's why when we look at the Hero Resiliency program, uh, program, you're looking at those pillars that Katie was talking about, and they're going to be dissected and trained over to your resiliency, your officers. So we um, recently conducted a survey to a law enforcement agency that has 271 employees. We ask questions about their basic demographics, um, you know, age, um, gender, different things, what division they work in. We included military experience and other first responder disciplines, um, culture support, and mental health and wellness. Um, we had, if you click again, uh, 136 people out of 271 responded. For those of you um, who, and I'm not a survey expert, but about 33% people respond and any kind of response from the agency just looking into these things. <clears throat> so when you get into some of the results, have you served in the military? You know, this is a great um, capture of how many of the percent of this law enforcement agency had previously served, which is 27.2%. When you talk about other associated first responder disciplines, you know, about 50% of the agency identified with other first responder disciplines. There is a huge crossover with law enforcement, fire service, EMS, dispatch. And even when you have the none, they're still involved in a first responder discipline of law enforcement um, in some capacity. So that's still a huge overlap um, of these different tiers of, of first responder disciplines. Yeah, when you get into the like uh, personality traits of the, the people that are first responders, law enforcement, you usually see a lot of crossover into a fire, like a volunteer fire aspect. The same with the previous slide we were showing you the percentage of the military that was actually in the law enforcement community so we identify that as more of a personality trait you know the service people that want to serve their community serve their countries so we asked the question do you believe you have received adequate training to deal with the mental health stressors related to your job you know 56.6 percent saying no you know we did this to help outline the needs for the hero program and the focus areas of what we need to do specifically for for the hero program so what does that mean that we need more training you know master and resiliency officer training additional training in the academy but with ongoing yearly updates you know, we need to give them the tools to identify burnout, stress reduction techniques, you know, and we don't want it to be taught by, you know, law enforcement. We want mental health, like with all of these pieces, there's a mental health component and they're part of the conversation. The experts are the ones that can come in and do my, you know, whatever, whatever meditation it is or whatever activity that it is that people are interested in, we want to bring the experts in, do the training and give the tools. And when I saw, you know, some of these results coming in, they, they tell you a sign. 
or they, they tell you something that your staff is, is saying. And to me, when I see this, I know that we do uh, training involving mental health and stress and stuff like that. But when I see such a large number, they know that it's not effective. It's not really reaching them to the point where it's making an impact. They know it and they can feel it. And that's where we look to the side of what Katie was saying, your master resiliency officer and your resiliency training can help those shortfalls. And so, you know, do you believe you have received enough training to deal with stress is a great question. But, you know, is there even stress? Because that question doesn't matter if there's not perceived stress. So we ask, you know, one being no stress and by five being extremely stressful. And they're telling us that they're stressed. That was their experience. And that just furthered our, our need to do more training. I think when this came in, we knew that, I mean, law enforcement is inherently our first responder community. It's a, an inherently stressful job. I think what kind of threw me was that they were at the level they were. I kind of thought it would be a little bit more in the middle. But when I saw the higher numbers to the three, four, five, that led to believe that, you know, obviously there's a lot of social issues and whatnot going on that can lead to that as well. So do you believe that there should be more resources available to you specific to peer supports, mental health and wellness? Huge, 75% said yes, they need more resources. So again, with the Bureau Program, Prevention, Peer Support Activities, Crisis Intervention and Post-Action Peer Supports. One of the things that we wanna mention with peer supports is that New York State doesn't have any laws, um, confidentiality laws that protect peers. Um, you know, have a workaround for that for people who are system trained and, and don't realize that. You know, it's to become ordained. George and I are now ordained ministers. <laughs> so that's a workaround for confidentiality that we have to, you know, take it into consideration. So most of the answers that were coming out of this, obviously the 75, it, they're thirsty for it um, and they want it. So with family support training, does your family or support system know who to ask for help if they notice changes in your activities of daily living, personality, or behavior? You know, we specifically listed increased drinking, isolating, sleep disturbances, you know, just as examples of what family could be seeing at home. When you when you see that this number of people don't think that their support system knows who to ask for help if they notice changes, means that we have to educate the support system. You know, we want to make sure that the family has, you know, education for signs and symptoms and who their contact person is within the agency. They're going to see stuff that's happening at home before people see it at work. So to educate them and make sure they know what the resources are if something happens is huge. I think what's important too about when you get into the family support uh, training is that it's actually going to be provided by our mental health people in the resiliency program. Um, I probably think, I don't think that a peer uh, providing that education will be as effective as it would if it was a mental health professional. Right. As far as the peer recreation um, and morale and wellness through recreation, so George would do a better job with this than I do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, this is actually something that I, I kind of pulled out from the military. Um, MWR was something that uh, if you're in the military, you would definitely have heard of because they, they have you mandated to do this. Um, when we looked at the survey, one of the things that I kind of threw into the program was like, you know, this was, it was good in the military. Um, I think it would benefit the program. Um, what really threw me off was the fact that we had 75% about that would participate. So if they're saying they would participate, then obviously this has to be expanded out. I had a situation a couple of years ago where I was in a, um, a veterans program. They invited me to go over and I had a, a line of duty death and I had uh, a local vets program invite me to a kayak and building class. Um, unfortunately, I was very busy at the time and I got there. What I recognized right away was it was 45 minutes of actually building the kayak and then a mental health professional came in and then we were just kind of opening up to each other. Um, and I knew right away that what this was, this was an MWR for mental health and, you know, that encouraged the, the guys to speak to each other. Um, I ended up asking one of my buddies that was in the military to take over my kayak building um, project because 
Unfortunately, he was getting a lot of um, issues legally and with the job. Um, so after the second attempt of me having him to take over the program, he took it over and he went to the kayak building class. Um, and what I noticed is by the time he was done building his kayak, he did a complete 180 in the, in the agency. He became the union president. He became an advocate for mental health awareness and stress reduction in the military community and also in the agency. So simple tasks such as this that people will engage in have a, a profound effect on the mental health of the um, staff. So as we look at retirement, this is something that was said to us by uh, a law enforcement officer recently. You know, the analogy that I don't want to be the banged out car at the end of my career. You know, when we, we look at this as, as an example of how you start your career and how you ultimately could end your career in regards to your mental health. I think a lot of people want to get through my, in my experience working, you know, with first responders, you hear them, they, they want to just get to the end of their career, you know, and then deal with all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of the law enforcement or first responders that's on this call right now, you came out of the academy and you were purring. You know, you really didn't know what you were getting into. And halfway through your career, you started to notice the bangs and the bruises that you were experiencing mentally. Um, and when this officer actually came out to me and Katie and it made this analogy, I was like, I had this epiphany. And it really does for a lot of people make a connection to what do you want to look like when you're retiring? You remember coming out of the academy and how you work, but uh, you know you don't want to retire and then just you know not be able to function in life. You want to be able to enjoy it. So one of the things that we do in trainings, you know, we'll go and do a mental health training and talk about resiliency. But we ask the question in the beginning of the training and have them do introductions. When we, it's always who they are, their name, their title, and how long they've been with an agency. You know, we just want to get to know our audience. And then at the end of the training, we ask, who are you outside of your job? Who are you outside of your career? You have to give people a minute to think about who they are outside of their career, because it, that's the struggle. Are you a parent? You know, are you an avid fisherman? Like, what are, what, who are you and how do you identify outside of that is the bigger question. And that's something that they have to start looking at before they retire out, because the identity is lost. You know, they identify so much as the first responder, they lose who they are outside. So what we actually were going to be doing, we were going to be actually launching our retirement first, mainly because we had so many people retiring. Um, we had almost 20, 22 people retiring from the agency. Um, and when we actually created the retirement thing uh, or training, we were looking at a three program and what it was going to do was we were going to bring in a panel of retirees, guys that have been retired for 10 years, five years, a year. And we were going to go over the mental health of that, that loss of identity, um, how to actually cope and become, you know, as a civilian, a lot of officers or a lot of first responders look at it as a civilian type of thing. Um, so once they go over the panel, then we have an actual mental health specialist come in and they talk about mental health, wellness and res resiliency. Uh, obviously, suicide is an issue for a lot of retirees. So a suicide prevention chunk, um, a science of addiction recovery chunk. And then we also do stuff too to make sure that they are going to be okay. We go over the financial wellness, resume building. What does the current job market look like? Do you need to get a job? Um, and then the retirement and benefits, deferred compensation plans, anything like that. So when we actually have the person leaving the agency, that we can engage with them back into the MWR program so they can still feel like they're a, a part of the family. A lot of the retirees that I engage with to come back in as peers, uh, retiree peers, um, one of the biggest things they felt like was they were severed from the family. They, no, they were no longer part of that. Um, so a lot of them will need that. They want to be engaged with the agency still after retirement. And two, you know, he said 22 people have retired out this year. You know, that's 22 people that have 20 plus years of experience that they're now using within the agency. 
And that's a really big thing to consider and having them being even brought back in the capacity of engaging with their peers, like they're the experts on, on this and, and what they have done throughout their life. And to make sure we still have access to all of that knowledge, all of that experience, I think is huge. What I actually learned was when I did engage it with some of these rich retirees, is they had their own little clubs, clips that they were on Facebook meeting. Um, a lot of times, you know, the biggest part of this program is mapping the resources you have in your area. So we threw this slide in. There's the survey itself probably, I think, has like 42 questions. We've only seen a few of them, but a, a big question and a huge thing for us, do you even feel safe asking for help in relation to mental health or substance use for yourself or a coworker if needed? You know, the fact that only about 40% said yes and the rest, you know, sometimes an unsure to me is ultimately a no. So a culture shift needs to happen where it is okay to ask for help and make sure that it's not going to be punitive. And then who do you ask for help if that happens? Is it going to remain confidential? The culture shift comes in by training. Training is one of the biggest chums. Um, another one is administrative being um from a top to the bottom fashion of they know what their method is so the administration has to get behind it and then the training has to follow and the stigma reduction yes i think that's such a huge piece so when you're actually looking at this and i was talking about the concept of actually having like an ics structure um it's not going to be blanketed across the country but it will follow the same thing and it's going to be you have your agency um, whatever the agency is, the region or the county, they will probably most likely be your master resiliency officer. They're going to lead the program. And what that actually does is it fosters or it seats responsibility to make sure that this is, you know, a sustainable type of program. When you get down, you're going to have your master resiliency officer and your mental health liaison. They're going to partner together. Um, if you have system teams, that's a very common practice already. And then you're going to have we in this area, this region, um, we've got green holster. We're marrying up together, and what we're doing is we're going to appoint resiliency officers or master resiliency officers in each of the disciplines. Um, because of the crossover, you're probably going to have a lot of people that may be wearing the same hats. For the larger or the more populated areas, you're only going to break them up. So, like I said before. What it really does is it places some sort of responsibility uh, to make sure that the master resiliency officer and the other officers have those responsibilities of the command structure and that they're taking care of their peers. They would create that network so information could be shared freely. A lot of times we may have a lot of resources in the law enforcement community and there's nothing for the EMS community. What we can actually do is when we're bringing those resiliency officers together, they can share those that information and those resources. Um, and by the end of you know, the um, implementation of a structure, that creates that sustainability across the um, disciplines. So this is just like a visual of what I was just talking about. You're creating that network of people. Um, you're going to have a lot of crossover, which is great because, you know, how many times have you gone to a training and that's where you found out that there was a certain resource in your area. Um, I've done many a trainings in the fire service, and then, you know, I'm pouring out information to them. Um, they poured information to me, which I in turn take back to my law enforcement agencies. And if anybody is ever involved with the veterans administrations in their areas, there is tons of resources. The biggest problem that they have is actually getting that information out. Um, we've married up with our um, veteran services in Ulster County and Green County, and the programs that they have and everything that's available in turn will also help stay a, a subject that I have or, you know, a defendant. But it, it's also in turn the crossover for the uh, guys that are working within the first responder community. So with that network, it creates the network. And obviously we know right now, currently, in what we have operating right now, there's no safety net, or if it's a safety net, there's holes all throughout it. And unfortunately, a lot of guys are falling through the cracks. I mean, a perfect example of what we were just talking about before, retirement. We know suicide's an issue in retirement. 
but we're not making an impact on those numbers. So there's your hole, and that's where your hero program or your resiliency program is going to catch these guys before they fall through the crack. Now, for our area, and we threw out, you know, all those hyperlinks in a couple of slides prior to, um, we kind of verbalized it a little bit different <clears throat> so you guys would understand it, but like our substance abuse response specialty team, not all areas are going to have it. Um, we have it as Oracle. You'll see it in the hyperlinks in the previous slides, um, but they will actually cross over into the resiliency. When we started our, um, it wasn't Oracle at the time, but we had a substance abuse response team. Um, when we started it, it was initially first just for the first responder community, and we were helping them get outreach, rehab, placement, stuff of that nature. Um, you also have the CISM teams or your peer support teams. They're going to overlap into the resiliency officer. And CIT, that's a big thing in New York State. The training is amazing. Um, but what it ends up happening is you have your hero resiliency structure. You can actually pull from your resiliency officers to help sustain your peer support system team or help sustain your Oracle substance abuse team. So we talk about um, all of this and then we talk about administration benefits. So this is. Congress did a law enforcement mental health and wellness act back, I think in 2017, 18 or 19, somewhere in there. They just looked at 11 different agencies that implemented peer support programs. Ben Police Department was one of the 11 departments. It's a similar program to what um, we're developing. Um, it was also similar in size. So what they saw at the end, you know, the outcomes of implementing a peer support program, it was a 40% decrease of on the job injuries, workman comp claims were down 27%, sick days and time off for injuries went down 77%. You know, anecdotal evidence showed, you know, leadership had improved attitudes and performance of all of their officers. There was a reduction in turnovers, call outs, health insurance costs, and supervisors spending less time on problem employees. So, you know, we, we know that this is going to be good for an agency, but to sell it to admin, there always has to be that benefit. And you may not see that, that then it's going to be bigger, but the outcome is going to definitely be much better for the agency as a whole. And also, I mean, administrative benefits, it definitely has to be pointed out, um, obviously, for our administrators. Um, but in a more humane way of looking at it, you are going to be taking care of your people. You're going to make sure that you're providing them all the resources that you could possibly give them. This slide kind of talks to the concept of some of the social issues that we've been faced in the past year, possibly more, is the fact of, you know, the police reform. Um, I know my sheriff loved this slide. He was absolutely in love with it. And if you're a part of any police reforms, I know that he took it and he ran with it. Um, but the concept is pretty simple. You know, if you're taking care of your employees, you're probably going to, or you're providing them the resources, you're probably going to get a better outcome or community involvement. Um, and that's another reason why officer wellness was identified in the police reform package. So some of the challenges that we have just with the program as a whole is that there's no substantial funding for this program. We're going to start up in a minute. So we submitted grants. Um, it's a pretty tough thing. There's lots of stuff happening nationally looking at this. Um, you know, George and I are also not dedicated to just this program. You know, we do this because we're passionate about it. We know it's going to work. And we know our, you know, sheriff's offices and the other agencies want this training to come in. So we are slow and steady working on this, you know, and the reality is that the state needs to closely look at, at what it provides for first responder disciplines in regards to their mental health and wellness. What are they going to mandate and how are they going to help also fund the support program? It needs to become a priority. So next steps, we're going to continue to work on the program of tentative launch at the end of the year. We're going to do some resiliency officer training. Um, and system training before that, and then standardization of resiliency in the community at a legislative level. I think that those are some of the, the bigger steps. Um, and then if you want to do a, a webinar or a training and not give you some things for the individual agencies, for the people that are here and wondering, how do we start this? How do we look at our own agency? You know, you have to start your internal audit. 
what do you currently have available? What do your employees even need? You know, we did the survey because that was our platform for they they told us what they needed, you know, and that was our our base of how this is gonna be implemented. Um, what backing do you have for this program for your administration, your legislative groups? Um, and then who are your resiliency officers? I think, you know, paying attention now and saying who are the people that everyone goes to to talk? Who are the people that it's not a political position? It's not going to be the best friend of your sheriff or the, you know, supervisor, you know, necessarily. You want it to be the people who are naturally the people who are gravitated to to talk when there's an issue or when other people are having issues. I know that the program in, it, in, in its entirety is not a complete reinvention. Um, we've had buddy checks, battle buddies. Um, what we're trying to do is actually formalize it and make it something that is, you know, proactive towards the agency. So we really wanted to take a minute for our first responders who are listening and say thank you. We know these images are hard. These images are not for you. You know how hard your job is for those non first responder groups. This is, you know, these are depictions that come up that were sent to us by first responders. And when you look at this, this is this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help this. We see our first responders. We hear you. We're coming for you. Just taking a bit. You know, it's unfortunate that this is their reality and we didn't want to end it on a bad note, but we wanted to, you know, hold up the mirror and say, this is what they are going through. That's it. Wow, fantastic, uh, Katie and George. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions that I'm gonna hold off until after John's presentation, uh, but I just wanted to thank you for that. And so um, I'm going to prepare to pivot to, uh, I can do this here, handing over the controls to John. Hopefully it will happen seamlessly. All right, John, you should have control now as a presenter. So when you are ready, feel free to share the screen. You're on mute just so you know. Okay, Lloyd, are you able to see the screen now? We're not seeing the screen. Oh, uh, you're in the process, it looks like. All right, I'm going to put up the uh, PowerPoint portion first, and we'll do the video later. Okay. Okay, is that yet showing? Uh, not yet. So we're back to where we were before, but for some reason it's not showing like with the video. Do you try the uh, share my screen? Right, that's what I'm trying to uh, share. Screen one, I'm sorry. Okay, there you go. Yep. Now, if you just bring up the PowerPoint, you should be good to go. Okay. Are we in business now? Yes. If you just go full screen on your. Yep. Got it. Okay. All right, Lloyd, that look good? Showing? Yep, if you want to just go to full screen or presenter view, or I mean, uh, yep, that one right there. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm still having trouble getting it going. Hmm. I'm not able to make any changes, change slides here. Um, you're going to have to go to from current slide. Try that. Right, that's fine. And show. Let me try it on screen two. No. There's also um, the little icon on the bottom right hand side next to the uh, yeah uh, the screen one, a little over. Yeah, try that one. Nope, uh, this uh, one over to the right. Nope, nope, the other way. Okay. Or double click on number one. Okay, now at least it's moving. Are you seeing it moving? Is it a full screen? Yes. It's okay. moving, it's just not full screen. Yep. Full screen on mine. All right. Hmm. All right. All right. I don't know why it's not going full screen. If anybody has a suggestion, otherwise I'll just see if it'll work this way. Yeah. Why don't, yeah. The only other thing would be to try double clicking on slide number one and see if it pulls it up. Okay. Is that switching it on your screen? Uh, it's. You have an, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and try to advance it? Yep, that advanced. Let me see if I can try doing this one more time here, getting back in using a different screen. Share. Did that do anything different? Oh, there you go. Yep. You're in. Okay. I just switched the screens. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. A little bit of an inconvenience. Uh, my name is John Petrullo and I'm the director of PAPA. A uh, little history on PAPA before I get started with the, the main information we want to put out there today about the SAFER program. PAPA was started back in 1996 within the NYPD because of a high rate of suicide in the two year period, 94 and 95, we had 26 of our police officers take their life. Uh, it was an alarming number. Uh, so the city council was involved, the mayor's office was involved, the police department, they were trying to figure out what could we do about it. So a recommendation was made, why don't we give the cops an option and have an outside organization of police officers helping police officers. Uh, and the department, with their blessing, uh, gave the okay to go ahead, let's get it done. So right now we had, when we started, it was basically a suicide line for more than 35,000 New York City police officers. Uh, now fast forward it, we've been doing this for 25 years, and we've become much, much more than a, a suicide, you know, call, a call line for a suicidal uh, cops. We now have, have, and we're proud to say with, with the help of others, we have changed the culture somewhat where our police officers are calling long before it gets to crisis. Uh, you know, through the different outreaches that are done and the information that they're given and the availability to peers, uh, it has made a huge difference. Peers are a main component, uh, especially in law enforcement and other first responders. Uh, it's more relatable. Uh, for mental health people in a room, um, police are usually a resistant to, to mental health professionals. We don't need it. We're the helpers. But with a peer system, it makes that smooth transition. We segue them from, hey, listen, we're cops. We're talking to you, and we're going we're gonna to bring you to this person. 
They understand the culture. They understand uh, what needs to be done. And that's work. So now they call them when the relationship starts going bad, when the stress starts to, to build. Unfortunately, we are still faced with a suicide crisis. And to me, one is a crisis. That's more than we should have. Uh, but with the sheer numbers that the New York City Police Department has, over 35,000, for us to have four or five, which is the average every year, is below uh, the law enforcement per 100,000. Um, high figures because it's four or five, but smaller departments, they have one every three years. They may be at a higher rate than us. And again, that's all attributed to all the services that are available. With the work, uh, the department working uh, in a collaborative effort with us to say, hey, let's give them services. We don't care where they go, whoever they go to, as long as they get the help. And that's really worked. Uh, and it's about options. Let the cop decide where they want to go. If they want to call department services, they want to go to a clergy. If they want to go to a, a private clinician that they find, that's all good. Uh, we have in the Papa organization over 200 volunteers uh, that are all police officers. We have 125 clinicians that we can call to set up appointments and get our cops into. We also have arrangements with some hospitals and some rehabs in the event of the substance abuse program. Uh, and we now have, as we've expanded every year, we've expanded to different programs. Again, starting originally as a suicide intervention or a call line, we now have bereavement program that we do. We have trauma response team, which we go out on all calls involving police shootings, police suicides, serious injury to a police officer. And we go out and check on the officers that responded to that to see how they are. And we do different types of, of programs with them. We do educational outreaches. And, and the most recent one we did, we were able to, to get 20,000 of our officers in an audience. And in you know small intervals up at the up at the ranges where they have to go every year, so we were able to give them the RSP program, our resiliency program. We also maintain two programs for our military. Uh, when they come back from the military uh, deployments, they are assigned to us for a day. And we have a program we put together with one of our psychologists, our peers, uh, and we give them a full day of uh, some of it self care and some of it is is educational information. And then our newest program, uh, which we put together is a safer program, which I will go over shortly. Um, we are, and I'm proud to say there are 200 documented cases over the last 25 years of cops who are at the point of putting the gun to their head and contemplating suicide that are alive today to talk about it because they picked up the phone and were able to reach out to a peer. Uh, so this definitely does work. Uh, one of our, our things we're pushing now is also self-care and what we will be doing for our police officers as a thank you, uh, police officers and those that are police officers in this group clearly know have been under horrendous conditions since the start of COVID leading into protests and, and all the anti-cop talk. Uh, was bad enough with the cops, as you know, as, as even civilians would know, difficulty with, with COVID, you know, Worrying about going home. Are you going to work? Can you stay home and work? Well, these men and women were out there every day, still doing their job. Um, you know, putting aside the the concerns of their own family members and their, their elderly parents, and then they were thrown on with with protests and people just not liking cops. I must say, through my career, and I don't think there's a cop alive today that could say that they've been through such a long period of stress as a whole. Um, in the history. This is the first time it lasted this long. There's always been things that would come up. They would have a, a limit to them. It would last a month and then it would go back to some form of normalcy. Here the cops are under a tremendous strain, uh, which we have seen that in our our cases and call volume. So peer is the way to do it and it's not to replace EAPs and it's not to replace the department services. They're all needed but you need to give them another outlet to go in case they're not comfortable with that. With all that said, I'd like to go into the newest program we have. And just to give you a little insight into the program, this program was started uh, very recently. We were doing it, just uh, taking it out there with the Zoom and we condensed it to, to a three hour Zoom. And it's actually more than a full day training it should be. Uh, it's consistent with some of the suicide intervention programs out there. 
Uh, we had utilized them and they are really good. However, there was a couple of components that we felt were missing. And before I go in any further into this, I just want to acknowledge somebody uh, that has been very helpful, and I believe you're in the group. But back in 2012, our suicides spiked, and we were in need of something additional. We needed to get the word out to our police officers, and we had help from inside of, of New York State Office of Mental Health, and that is Sylvia Gelati. Uh, I want to thank her because she has been an inspiration to us and pushed, uh, you know, through her initial stages of helping us. It has really, you know, helped us project even even further with all of this and, and putting this program together. So she it was a vital part, an inspirational, and a person who has no agenda and no ego when it comes to this. She clearly just wants to help. So Sylvia, I'm pretty sure you would be in here. So thank you very much for all of your help and support. Uh, so what we did was this program was put together. We normally did the two day program and it was hard for us to get uh, the cops either time off or to come in for two days on their time because we wanted to flood the department with this and give everybody the skills on what to look for when somebody was going down that path of, of contemplating suicide. So most of them, the meat and potatoes is the same in, in just about every program. There's you know ways to ask the questions and to listen and all. But there's a couple of things that we felt were listening, especially the population of first responders. Uh, so in this case, it'll be for, uh, for law enforcement and police officers within our department. Uh, we've geared this to be able to, uh, and the acronym breaks down to suicide awareness for emergency responders. So with a change of certain videos and using specific uh, issues that each different profession has, such as paramedics, EMTs, police, fire, we can curtail this program to fit more specifically to them. Uh, but one of the things was, and other programs had listening, but listening for reasons uh, why a person may want to die, we, we've kept that and that's a great part of it. But we also felt it important to teach our cops and their family members how to be better listeners. So what we did was we started with some listening skills to get them in tune to that. You know, we could listen, but are we really hearing what the person is saying? And that's crucial in this. So as I start going through the slides here, you know, it has where, you know, most of us were told to listen. You know, as children, hey, you listen to me. As adults, you better listen to me. Nobody ever really taught us what the proper way to listen is. Uh, we have, you know, God willing, we were all born with hearing, and we have the ability to hear things as they come in. But it's different than actually listening. There's, there's an art to listening. Uh, clinical people in this room may have that art down a little better because of, of training as to what to listen for. But in the emergency responder category, basically you're taught to go in and fix something, take control, get it done, get it done quickly. Sometimes listening uh, is replaced by fixing. So we wanna make sure that they're not going in in a fixing mode and they learn to listen better. And one of the things is, is why sometimes we may not listen, which is a problem. And one of them, you know, could be uh, we stop listening because we don't want to hear what's being said. And, and just a reminder, with this, I'm going to, I'm taking a little bit from each section. This, again, is a full day, very packed training uh, that we may have to still trim down or add some time to. But this is just some of the, the highlighted uh, versions of it. You don't want to hear, you don't care what's being said, you don't care for the person that's saying it. And a couple of the main ones here that we deal with is you're preoccupied, you're very busy, I don't have time for this. Uh, or instead of listening, you're waiting for your turn to talk or respond, which I've had numerous conversations with people where I can actually see they are no longer listening, they're just waiting for their chance to respond. So we just make them conscious of that, and so this way they can, can identify it when they're in a conversation and, and go back to listening mode. John, I, right, so so many know, gates. I, I don't know if you were advancing the slides, but they're not showing as advancing on our end. Oh, they're not, okay. Uh, how about now? Nothing now? No. You might need to just to expedite things, go back into the, the smaller view, go out of presenter view, just. Uh, One other way I'm 
I lost the whole screen now. Your screen is still up here. I mean, we're still seeing the opening slide, but that's that's it. That's it. And right now, anything? No. Now this should be on my screen. I don't know if you're getting it though. No, we're just still seeing the opening slide in full presenter mode. Okay. Anything now? I might have to hit the escape button. Okay, nothing yet. Uh -uh. Yeah, let me start this and I'll bring it back in again. Okay. Okay. Share. It's coming up on my end, but not yours, I guess, right? For now, we're still. Uh, Go ahead. You had it for a second now that the slide's not open. Oh, there you go. It's opening now. Okay, you got it now? Yes. Yeah, let's see if they'll change now. Okay, anything changing? Yep, yep. you got it. Okay, all right. Uh, very good. Uh, so I'll get you caught up. Instead of listening, we're waiting for our turn to talk. Uh, which was was problematic a lot of times in situations when they're out handling jobs, so we need to change them a little bit. Uh, so many en engaging skills, and just go over with them listening, you know, to this to complete story, staying focused on them, avoid distractions, which there are many, and we have a whole section just on distractions. Uh, not to interrupt the person. Don't argue with them if you if they're wrong what they're telling you. Just listen to them. And don't give advice. That's one of the biggest things with emergency responders and police officers is giving advice to fix the problem. Um, you know, they're on a job. How can we get this job done? They give people advice. So here we need them to concentrate on their two ears and one mouth. Uh, maybe we should listen a little bit more. All right. We also go over some of the the positive listening skills that are non nonverbal. The eye contact least indicating that you're listening to them. Sitting there with your legs uncrossed and arms uncrossed, leaning forward, nods when appropriate. A silence could also mean that you have their full attention. You know, we've had sometimes peers, uh, you know, went on a meet, they would, they would somewhat be distracted. And it happens so often with technology today, us going to our phones. And when I speak to some of our cases, uh, when I meet with them, they'll say, you know, there was something about that, that when I met with the person, I wasn't comfortable because they were so preoccupied with looking at their phone, answering a text. So we try to emphasize the importance of shut everything down while you're doing these interventions, but that the person in need has your full attention. And some of this may be common sense, but a lot of times we do it, we're not even thinking about it when we're doing it. You know, in some of those distracted behaviors, people checking the time on their phone or they're, they're checking their cell phones, fidgeting, you know, they have ones where, you know, you just do things that just aren't comfortable to the person, you know, picking at your clothes. And uh, long story short, I, I had a, a sit down with somebody. There was a couple of us in a meeting and it was a, a very serious meeting. It was, it was, you know, long time investigations going on. And the person who was the head of this unit, as he sat there and people were talking, he was looking down with his nail clipper and clipping his nails which totally sent a message to me and the person I was with that we're done with this. I'm not even going to talk here. This person isn't listening and he may have been listening and that was his way of concentrating, but to the receiver of it, it was really uncomfortable. All right. And then we also go into with them some type of listening skills, different listening skills. And, and two of the main ones that we emphasize is the closed ended and open ended questions. Uh, and we, you know, part of our protocol is they must ask certain questions when meeting with a cop, even if it's not brought up. And those two things are, do they drink alcohol or take any substances? 
or are they thinking of taking their life, killing themselves, or, or completing a suicide? For those, we emphasize that that should be, must be a close-ended question. We don't want room for explanation at that point. We want the yes or no. Um, although things also with, with open-ended questions, uh, we, we encourage them to use the open-ended to engage in conversation and get them talking. Some of the other listening skills, such as the paraphrasing, the reflection, the clarifying, summarizing, affirmation, we go over them with them, but there's a lot of gray area in there. Is it a reflection or are you summarizing? But we just give them some familiarity with it so that they're comfortable with it and they know how to try to get additional information out of the cop they're talking to. One of the other things is the, connect, the connection they make that, that engaging them in a positive way makes the difference, all the difference in the world when it comes to it being a positive outreach. You know, if they can win the confidence them over, if they have that, you know, that understanding, they show the empathy, it makes such a huge difference in uh, the offices opening up and talking to them. All right, so after we get through that, then we get into the portion of, of the program, which is the real ESP, uh, as we have, have given that acronym, which is the red flags, the E is for engage, the A is for ask, the L is for listen, and then the ESP part has to do with the, the risks and the safety plans and all of that. Uh, so with that, when we go through this part, and it'll just be very brief as to not take up too much time with it, it's kind of the meat and potatoes of most programs. We have to get to the bottom uh, of, of certain topic or certain uh, reasons that they want to take their life. So as it all starts, we go with red flags first. And again, simply being red flags is the warning signs that they're putting out to us. All right, so to be aware and we, we give them information on how to better recognize it, um, the warning signs of it. And with this, and, and I, I generally explain it in, in very simple way is that a lot of times we get people who miss this or don't want to be bothered with it and they just don't know. You know, there was there was cops that we meet with unfortunately after their partner takes their life or their family member and it's very rare that I don't hear, wow, if I only knew that. And the other thing was, you know, I knew something was wrong. My gut was telling me something wasn't right with him or her. And they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't They didn't have the skills as to say, wait a minute, let me sit him down and talk to him because everything kicks in. Well, I can't say anything. I don't want to, what about if I'm wrong? They'll be, in, you know, they're they embarrassing them. Might they say it and ask them and, and then they'll turn around and do it. So we give them all that information, which again, in any program, it's all the basic meat and potatoes. Then we get into the engage portion of it, which that's simply, you know, checking out and discussing your concerns with the suicidal person. Uh, we also emphasize the fact that there should be, and hopefully we can get that where, where everybody understands the no bystander part of it. Um, everybody has to play an active role in this. Can't be, well, you know, he said something and I don't want to jeopardize his career and I'm just going to dismiss it. So we emphasize that bystander. Everybody has to, to get involved some way, even if it's getting somebody else to do it for you, bring it to somebody's attention uh, so that, that we can we can get them help. Uh, fortunately, uh, in our department, NYPD, I clearly see the culture changing where cops will do that now. We get calls from other cops saying, listen, so-and-so needs, he, he's in a bad place. And they encourage him uh, to give us a call or they bring him to us and we're able to get him. They're spotting it much earlier and it's not, they're not as concerned now with, listen, I don't want to jeopardize his career, but I also don't want to see him die. So that death part of it is really bringing them out to, to get the person help. Uh, then we get into the ask portion about asking them the question. Right? And again, same as other program, ask it clearly and directly. Uh, remember the person that's suicidal for the most part wants to talk about it. Uh, and we suggest to them that they, they ask it clearly and directly. And sometimes when we go around and they give examples in the group, the classes we're doing, they'll say, are you thinking of hurting yourself? And we have gotten away from that. We don't put that in there anymore because we've had cops that were uh, able to answer it truthfully in their mind. No, I'm not thinking of hurting myself. But what they were thinking of doing was killing themselves. And it was a difference to them. It wasn't hurting, it was fixing. It was taking the pain away. So now we have all our peers when they meet with people and then there's 200 peers out there doing this. Uh, very directly asking them, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of 
taking your life or killing yourself, but it has to include those words. And again, most want to talk about it. There's that 80 20 rule where 80% want, want to talk to somebody about it and 20% made up their decision. Well, we want to get them when they're in that 80% uh, category. All right, this is awfully, uh, usually the hardest step for a cop, at least I could speak for the cops, to ask this question. It's extremely difficult. Usually, when trainings, we turn around and say, say it to each other and get them comfortable with it. Uh, because they tend to jump into the fix it mode, all right, the quick solution for it. And many times that's not the right way to do it. Uh, and in, in the law enforcement field, you know, the example we would use if you go out to a dispute and it's a husband and wife and he pushed her and she pushed him. And we think we fix it by telling them, okay, why don't you go take a walk now and let things cool down. Uh, and then he comes back more angry that the police were called. So we didn't fix it. We, we put a, a temporary bandaid on it so that we can complete that, which no longer happens. Uh, they now are required to do a whole lot of paperwork when something like that happens. Hence, it was because of, of those situations in the past. So we try to get them to ask the question directly and don't try to fix, the, so fix it for them and give them solutions. And then the next part is another section on listening, but this listening is not the listening skills. This is trying to listen for their, their reasons, why they want to take their life, why they're considering suicide. You know, and again, stay away from giving them the reasons to live. How many times you hear, you know, hey, I'm thinking of maybe I'm, I'm not happy here. I want to take my life. And what happens is, is the police officer tries to give them reasons not to do it. Hey, look, you have the perfect life. You have, you know, whatever the perfect life may be. You have a spouse, you have kids, you have a car, a boat, a house, everything. And, and as many in the group here already know, well, that may not be helpful because he's thinking I lost all of that and I did have the perfect life and it may not be helpful. So that's one of the many examples we give them as to why not to try to fix it for them. And again, as you know, if you've been doing any of the other programs, you listen for that reason where there might be a spark. They talk about someone or something that we can then, you know, uh, capitalize on that by speaking to them about that, that spark that went off. All right, then after that, we get into the explore, the risk. Again, pretty, pretty standard stuff. You know, let's talk about the plan. How are you gonna take your life? Is it lethal? Do you have the lethal means to do it? Uh, in our population, the means are there with just about everybody. Uh, and unfortunately, being that it's the firearm, it doesn't give that cool down period or for time to them to, to think it over. It's right there, it's instant and it's deadly. So we have to build in oil all the time when we're dealing with our cops that, okay, there is a weapon there that, that can easily be accessible. And then go into some of the other stuff about, you know, any history of it. Did they have thoughts in the past? Did they, they attempt in the past? Uh, other things in their life, whether they abused, whether there's an illness involved, or whether there's any kind of loss involved. And uh, another one that, that we'll be putting on there uh, is investigations. Uh, we explore any investigations while they're working because we found in our population investigations uh, and especially ones that make the media and they, and in many cases, the people who take their life over it were very minimally involved in that, but the embarrassment of it for and for them uh, caused them to take their life. So that's another area that we go into with them. So we go over that and, and see what it's, uh, where it lays and then we get into the next part as to what do we do with it now if we're hearing that somebody is suicidal and contemplating suicide or is it something that we can maybe connect them to a clinician and they can go on their way but in many cases involving suicidal ideation because the peer system and we clearly remind our peers that we're not clinicians we're not there to, to diagnose we're not there to figure out we're there to say, this sounds like this person could be suicidal. And once we determine that, we no longer are leaving them. We're staying with them till we get them into help. So it won't just be at this point, connect you with family, connect you with clergy, whatever it may be. We're gonna stay with them until we get them into one of our 125 clinicians. If they're not available, if it's those unfortunate times when it happens at uh, two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday evening, well, then we have contracts with some hospitals that we can take them to and get an eval done. And fortunately, sometimes when we do that, we bring them into the hospital and the hospital does their eval. 
and releases them. And then we're able to then go into the next part of the safety plan of connecting with a clinician that they can make an appointment with, finding out what's in their life that that may be, uh, you know, worth starting to, to enlist in their help, such as you have other family, do you have another place to stay if you need it, if they're isolated and alone. Um, so we, we try to keep them safe for the immediate future with that. And then after that, we have, of course, the post uh, follow up uh, just to see how is it going. Is there anything else we can do for them? Uh, and again, this again is just a small piece of a whole lot of other information that gets brought out in the training. This is just to give you a taste of it. Uh, the suicidal person uh, does complete suicide and, and sometimes it happens where you may engage with a person and then find out somewhere down the line that the person did take their life, we want to remind them that it was in spite of all of their, their, their intervention and everything they did. We make sure that, that our peers, when we do this, follow a strict protocol, and that strict protocol is in place just for that reason. So that if God forbid something happens like that, that they're not feeling guilty, what did I miss, what, I should, what should I have done? We make sure we dot all our I's, cross our T's, and make sure we get them into a mental health professional before leaving them if we feel that this person could be contemplating suicide with an active plan. Uh, and then after that, or another component that we added in was self-care. And the people who do these interventions, and I could speak more on behalf of the peers in PAPA, they do a phenomenal job. They put themselves out there. These are cops that are, go above and beyond and are so dedicated, which would be probably with any peer group in any profession. Uh, so we always remind them how important it is for them to take care of themselves. So that's why we had this section added on, just to let them start to consider doing some form of self-care. So we have this section in it, and what it does is, is it just gives a few statements and topics uh, as far as, you know, it promotes physical and mental health and helps maintain a healthy work life balance and work balance. You know, listen, and what it comes down to, a happy worker is a worker that's going to have you know, less stress in his life. He's going to be a better worker. And in the lines of a police officer, uh, if we can de-stress them a little bit and, and have them have a, a better type of self-care, they're going to have better interactions with the, part of the public. It's a win-win for everybody. So we want them to enjoy and live fully just in, instead of just existing. And then we go into what they do. We ask them to, to talk to us a little bit about what they do for self-care, why it's so important. Uh, and many of the reasons we get with self-care, and, and I was surprised when we started doing this, we're talking to a group of cops and we're engaging them in conversation, and most of them, I don't know, I don't do anything for self-care. And then we'd get the few that would say, well, I run, I jog, I, and normally I would pick the one who says they're runners and find the one who's the most active runner. You know, get me one of those five-day-a-week runners that are out there every day doing six, seven miles, and to them, it, it works for them, it works great. But just to show how it's not all athletics, because a lot of the things that come up, they spell out athletics. And what about if you're not athletic? What can you do then? And I usually compare myself to those runners. And I explain to them that I haven't run more than a, a few blocks since I graduated from the police academy back in the 80s. Um, and for them, it's that great release. For me, it did absolutely nothing. So I stopped doing it. So we have to think of what else could work for self-care. Is it going for a massage? Is it going for the mani-pedi? Is it, you know, whatever else you might do, sitting in the park with a cup of coffee and looking at a tree. Uh, so we try to get them to start thinking that way, what works for them, because the majority of our cops do absolutely nothing. And then we just go into a few pictures of, of good self-care. You sleep better, you get some exercise, uh, you know, you eat better as opposed to the other side of the coin where you're not feeling well, you're having arguments all the time, there's alcohol and other substances involved. And then we go into a little bit about the signs of, of poor self-care, right? Do you find yourself overeating and uh, you know, or overreacting, I'm sorry, to minor events? Are you overeating or undereating? Do you feel like you're, you're not acting like you normally would? Have other people commented about your behaviors? So we just, again, it's to enlighten them a little bit. Now with police, there are some things that, that are built into this, this profession. Working hours that are unusual and interfere with holidays and family events. 
cause a lot of stress. You know, your, your family wants you home at certain holidays and sorry, you can't be there. Conflicts between work and your family roles get, get kind of blurred and crossed over sometimes. Uh, there's, there's mood changes and behavioral changes associated with some of the stuff you may see as a first responder. And then you have the job stress, the administrative stuff that, that I don't think there's anybody goes through their career in this type of environment where they don't have those job stresses. And then difficulty when they get home trying to say, hey, let me shut this off, let me relax. So we kind of try to get them to commit to us that they're going to make a plan for self-care and how they're going to build it into the day. Uh, again, when you have good long-term self-care, it, it, it just builds into your daily life and boosts your resiliency. You're better able to handle other things. You identify where your anxiety is coming from and address those areas or issues, be it through working it on your own or, or going to a mental health clinician. Uh, be kind to yourself. Stop beating themselves up. We go over that with them because many times happen on a job and they'll keep second guessing themselves and beating themselves. I should have, I could have. And we get them to focus now on the lack of doing self-care. Uh, it should be a mandate is what we, we tell them. It should be mandated that you do self-care. And a lot of times we explain it to them as they come to work, they might be working from seven in the morning till three in the afternoon. They have to get home. They have childcare issues. They have to pick kids up at school. They have to do homework. They may have elderly parents. And then we tell them to do a quick inventory and see how much in that day they did solely for themselves. They're great at doing for others, getting to work, doing for family, but what'd you do for yourself? And that's not unusual in emergency responders' lives. It's, it's about everybody else that they're helping. Uh, so now we get them to try to get them to get enough sleep, eat a, a balanced diet, get exercise, fresh air, play nice with others. Uh, we are also, as a way to thank our police officers, as soon as this COVID lifts, we are, are going to take the cops away. Uh, for at least an overnight, or we were considering a weekend, but we may get a larger response since COVID and the protests. We may just do overnights. And we're going to bring them in and do presentations throughout the day with them. And it's going to be based on self care. It'll be a, a touch on suicide awareness, as, as in all of our, our programs, we touch on that. But then it's going to be self care. It's going to be how to better your relationships. We're going to do a little piece on the five love languages. We're going to have self-care stations set up where they can go into one room and, and meditate. They can go to another room and, and get a 10-minute massage. Uh, and then that evening, we're going to have dinner for them, the lunch for them. We're going to have entertainment come in. We're going to hopefully find some, some comics to come in, do a comedy show, and just start them on that road to better self-care and taking care of themselves. Two different ones set up because we have some that they're going to be able to come with their significant other. We want them to bring it so we can we can share with both of them how to better their relationships. Uh, then we got the other side where they don't have significant other or they just don't want to bring that significant other for one reason or another. So it'll be two different weekends. So we're doing our best to try to push this whole uh, concept of self-care for them. All right. And then again, we try to give them, you know, learn to satisfy their needs in a healthy way. You know, safety and security would be great to, for all of us to have love and connection, significance. And, you know, love and connection, significance doesn't have to be with, in all cases, another human being. And I'll usually use the example of people with dogs. And I, I asked them, I said, is the dog house trained and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Can I have it? Absolutely not. They, they'd give me their kids before they'd give me their, their dog. So there's a lot to say for that, those other types of relationships that we can have, be it going out and volunteering and getting involved with groups like this. Um, and then to sum it all up, you know, we know that, that law enforcement and, and emergency responders uh, it puts you at a greater, re a greater risk for a variety of other conditions, psychological, medical, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, bad marriages. Uh, so we try to, to bring that all into, into a light where we can get them to start small, pick something and start it working. Uh, would be know their personal personal needs. We also tell them don't start large. Don't go out and join the best gym because you're all pumped up that you're going to start it and pay $200 a month and go to the gym every day for a week or two weeks and then you slowly phase off and you're paying the money for nothing. We try to get them to do 30 minutes a day. You'd go sit in your man cave, go watch a show, go 
you know, do something that you enjoy and then slowly build it, set the time aside, just like you're at work from seven to three, or maybe you have to slate, uh, slot yourself seven to 7.30 at night as your time, you know, just for, for downtime and change bad habits. Some of the, one of the things we cover in the, in the love languages is sometimes the spouse doesn't understand when the person comes home, listen, leave me alone for a half hour. I just don't want to talk. I don't want to just let me sit. And they kind of get all over them. Why not? What's the matter? They think it's something with them. And sometimes that's their self-care. I just need a half hour. So open communication with partners is also emphasized in this. Uh, so with that, that covers everything. And, and time allotted, uh, Garrett, if that video, if I can get that to come up, I'd like to share with them uh, the video. If we have yeah, time. We're, in good, we're in good shape, John. It's uh, 135, and I think the video is seven minutes. Um, and then that'll give us some time to ask questions for both, for both presentations. So if you want to okay. try to swap that over. Very good. And and before I do that, I'll just give you a little background on this. Uh, one thing is the reason we're coming out with the safer is we want to, and we're willing to share this for anybody in the audience that needs it. Anybody that wants to take it, you can come and take it with us. You know, we always, we always invite outside groups into our trainings when we have them. Um, so anybody just reach out to me if you need it. The video we're going to show you is a testimonial of three cops who called, uh, who needed some help. And they got the courage to pick up the phone and call. All three of these officers were very close to taking their life. And they're going to explain it. For those of you that are in law enforcement, you, you may get touched by it a little more because it goes through their early days. They start to explain when they were in the academy how excited they were. They were becoming cops. Shield day comes. And then what changed in there that brought them to the point of taking their life? Uh, I'll give you a little background on the three of them. Uh, this is a mix from the police department. One is now a retired lieutenant. We used our our retirees because our active cops were a little nervous, and we got to meet them where they're at in case the department didn't like the idea that they were suicidal at one time and put some kind of flag in their folder. So we got the retired guys who to do this. One was a first grade homicide detective. Uh, for those of you that don't know the ranks within the police department, first grade homicide detective, you made it to the top of the detective rank. Uh, when you're in homicide, there's a few other divisions they can go to that you make it to the top. And these are your your macho cops that are out there that you see on TV. They make TV shows about these guys. And this officer was involved in an incident where, and some of you may remember it, a number of years ago, there was a missing child in Borough Park who was found in two pieces. Uh, and when I talked to the new recruits, I used to use that example. How do you deal with that? How do you you know, part of them was found in a freezer, the other half was found in a suitcase. And I asked them, how do you deal with that? You know, when you're in academy, there's only so much they could teach you to, to bring awareness. And I always wondered about this guy, though. This was before we were doing outreaches on that. And uh, lo and behold, a few years later, he's sitting in front of me. And he was the one who unzipped the suitcase. To this day, he still can't take a zipped suitcase with him on vacation. Uh, but he got to the point where he's going to kill himself. So he'll tell his story. The other one is another cop whose partner uh, was killed in 9-11. And the third one was just one of, one of our highway cops that, that just was having a rough time. So with that, I just wanted to give you the background. It's not a 9-11 story because it kind of starts with 9-11. Let's see if we can hear it. We don't want to be a document, so we don't want to be a one who want to be a bus driver. The whole space, at one point, you didn't want to become a cop. Gary, are we seeing and hearing this yet? Seeing it, but the audio is a little um, cloudy. Okay, I'm going to do that by moving, I'm moving the computer again to that location closer to. So I'm just going to make that disappear. Early on, service as a vocation. I always wanted to be a cop. I was a, I was a cop. Well, we want, you know, Maybe you could restart, start it from the beginning. I, I think it's so a little I, lagging. I remember one week I wanted to be a doctor, next week I wanted to be a, next week I wanted to be a bus driver. Like most kids, at one point you didn't want to become a cop. In my family, it was kind of instilled in me early on, service as a vocation. I always wanted to be a cop. 
I was it. I was a cop. Well, you know, cops and robbers. You want to be a robber? That's great. I don't want to be a cop. I remember walking with my mom on on Fifth Avenue in Sunset Park, and I saw this neighbor of ours we had grown up with. I remember looking, and I see a police car, and he was in that. He was in the police car, and he was driving, and I was like, "Wow, that's that's what I want to do." I was young. I came on. I was twenty years old. Uh, so I wasn't even old enough to drink and they were giving us a gun and telling us, you know, let's go out there and patrol the streets. I kind of grew up in a, you know, in a sort of, sort of patriotic household. I grew up with the, uh, the beach where I used to run outside my, my parents' bedroom window. I enjoyed hanging out with my friends, uh, bike riding. They raised my sister and I and the best they could. And I had a, it was a good childhood. For the most part, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. My friend gave me his father's leather jacket and his eight-point hat. I put it on. I looked at myself in the mirror, and I'm like, hey, I look pretty good at that. I, <laughs> it's pretty cool, you know? Graduation day. Uh, it's a day I'll never forget. I, I was very proud to, to be sworn in. We're all in uniform for the very first time. Empty holsters, no shields on. Next thing, we usher you into a, into a room. And you, know, you go on the line, and then they issue you a firearm, and you, you're loaded for the street. And next thing you know, they put you in another room, and they're like, "Yeah, hey, put this in your pocket. Put this in your pocket." And all you want to do is look at it. You know, <laughs> put it in your pocket. I remember getting into the classroom, and everybody's putting their tins on, and you know, it was, it was one of those sketch shows. Um, it was a good. That's a good memory. <laughs> The first thing that happened was somebody started screaming into the radio, boy, murder, that, uh, that the plane had hit the World Trade Center. While I was helping the people off the escalator, I ran into my sergeant, Terry Murray, again. And I tapped him on the shoulder. He, I saw him, he was talking to a couple of firefighters. I said, hey, Timmy, just let you know, I'm, I'm right here. And I, I went to go turn around to him again, and I was going to say, well, I said, listen, you know, I, I don't have a radio. You, you know, we should stick together. And, and he was gone. He was, you know, he, he ran back wherever he went. He went back into the building. You know, I, I, I wanted to be, you know, part of the, you know, the, 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 the guys. You know, I wanted to be one of the guys that, that, uh, that brought a book to his family. I could just be sitting down having a dinner, and all of a sudden I would just start sweating to like the walls were closing in, my throat was closing up, my heart would start pounding. I needed to get out of where I, wherever I was, I, I needed to get out and just, be by myself. I remember just coming home from work at nights and uh, I would basically just lay in bed and uh, watch TV, stare at the walls and think of um, no, what's the easiest way for me to do this. Young Jewish boy who was uh, but was allowed to walk home for the first time by himself for the first time, and he went missing. And subsequently, we ended up finding him uh, in a suitcase. And I, I just remember that opening the suitcase. I have a two year old right now. But back then, it was my oldest. I just couldn't put it together, you know? Uh, and I deserved to drink. I deserved it. Nobody saw what I had seen. Nobody could understand. Uh, and I really couldn't go home and tell my wife, hey, you know, you're not going to leave what I'm going to work today. It got to the point where my drinking became the one thing I wanted to do all the time. And at one point, I just couldn't stop. And in the height of it, looking myself in the mirror, I just hated it. I hated that reflection. What, three pounds of pressure. And we do this. And I said, oh, what Unless you walk from the shoes of a New York City police officer in this environment, you really have no idea what, I mean, what, what it's about. You're having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. I had a friend who was a, a peer counselor uh, for Papa. I knew I didn't want to go to the job. and. I, I kind of put my faith in him. Sat down, we had a cup of coffee, and I told him my situation. I spoke to him. 
they're not going to take your guns and shields and put you in the orders and voucher and create a paper trail. They're not going to, they're not going to add to, to whatever is going on. Papa gave me the opportunity to work on me. The Papa program is, it's, it's not part of the police department and it's confidential. The only thing that you would actually ever see that, 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 you know, as far as if you would have pulled up my sick record, you would have saw that I was out sick from uh, March, whatever it is, of 2002 to May of 2002. That's it. It, it gives you a, a cop-friendly environment in order to turn around and seek help from people that understand what, what you go for, you know, what, what cops go for. But they also allow you the opportunity to, to grab onto someone else. You want to go with like-minded people, with people who have been through what you've been through. The stories may be different, but the end result is always the same. I know I'm a better person than I was before this whole situation. It's made me stronger. Papa saved my life. I know that, that I still have purpose in life. You know what I mean? And, and I'm excited to, to, to be able to, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm just happy to still be here. The sunrise will always bring a better day, even though you don't see it. The sunrise will always bring a better day. If I would have shot myself in 2014, I wouldn't have 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017. And you know what? It was worth it. It was worth the wait. Okay, John, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, and just before I lose sight of it, um, I don't know if there's a link that uh, folks have asked uh, about possibly sharing a link to this. Um, I don't, that video, I don't know if that's something that's ready for prime time or that can be shared. So you, um, something to think about, or if you have the answer now, um, but I think for some folks, it may have been hard to get, get it sort of condensed with the video and the audio. So if that's something that can be made available at some point in time, I think folks would love to be able to watch that. So um, any thoughts on that? Uh, we don't have it yet out there open to the public. We do have it on Facebook and it's a, it's a coded one. Uh, shortly we will because it, it was just came out at the end of uh, of last year. So we were getting it out throughout the department first. But yeah, eventually we will be putting it out there where people can get on and see it. Okay, that, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I hope so it came over clear and, the, and I hope the voices matched up because their stories were truly touching and and it's because of what everybody in this room does, the caring people that, that gave them the confidence to call and to get help. And uh, just to follow up, they're all doing very well now. Uh, they're out there. One is a professional photographer now, lives in Tampa. He's on, he's on the field during the Super Bowls at the Kentucky Derby. He's really doing well. Uh, the one who was playing the bagpipes is still playing the bagpipes with the department, retired lieutenant. He's one of our peers now. And uh, and Lou is a phenomenal new relationship, three-year-old baby now doing phenomenal. We keep in touch. So it's all really beautiful stories how they all worked out. Thank you, John. And I think that is such an important reminder that everybody runs up against things in their lives that impact them, but these stories of of hope and wellness and recovery and resilience are as important, if not more so, to not just talk about the hard times, but to talk about what people can use to sort of work through those. Doesn't mean that they're not gonna encounter those challenges in the future, but those stories of hope and, and resilience are so important. Um, we got about 12 minutes left, and I wanna try to loop back to some questions. Um, I'm gonna start sequentially with some questions that came up for uh, George and Katie, and um, hopefully we'll have some time. Also, a couple of questions, John, for you. So, uh, George and Katie, the questions that we had, 
included what about the issue of substance use and abuse, what resources are available, um, and uh, so I guess I'll, I'll start with that one and see if either of you want to handle that, or John for that matter, I think for, for any department, but what, what, uh, what about the issue of substance abuse and use? Here, just to clarify, it's the what resources are available for first responders struggling with substance use. Uh, I believe so. I that was sort of how the question was framed. What about what about the issue of substance use and abuse resources available? Uh, stress on crucial issue of attention to this to this to that topic. So does that come up? I guess in in the workshop. Yeah, so 1 of the things that we um, did is we had a bunch of 1st responders trained in the science of addiction and recovery. Um, we are going to be taking that training and making it 1st responder friendly. So we want to be able to talk to 1st responders about the science of addiction, not only in practice, working with the public in any capacity, but looking internally. And a lot of times it's about how you frame it. So it's not, you know, are, do you have an issue? It's. Can you help identify a partner or a, a coworker that is struggling? So there, there is a training. There is a whole component on this specifically um, that that's being launched at some point. It's a part of the Thank hero. You. It's a huge part of the hero program, and there's like with the impacted citizen program in Green County that was listed in the Oracle program. They have designated officers that that work with first like first responder community. It kind of grew. I know one of the questions before that I kind of saw on the side that was talking about misuses of SISM, and that was kind mm -hmm. of one of the areas that we were we were dealing with that, which you know that's really not what it was designed for. So we actually broke it out into its own substance abuse team. Um, initially, it was started just for first responders, um, and what it is is like she said, the training with science addiction and stuff like that. But then we get them to resource map what they have in the area that's vetted for first responders, and then also the outside resources out of state. Okay. Um, this was a question specifically in relation to one of the slides, uh, Katie and George, um, asking to double check on a comment about clergy and confidentiality. Uh, the person noted that as a clergy, their understanding is that confidentiality is not protected unless they're designated as a chaplain for the agency uh, or unless they're coming to me as a part of the specific faith community, but not as a result of work within the agency. So I guess just wanting to sort of get clarification or your understanding on how confidentiality in the clergy works. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. So one of the things that came up too that we had seen was about training and you don't have to have buy-in from an agency for the program. Their training can be done at any point in time if your agency wants it, you know, and wants resiliency training or wants specific training about mental health awareness or science of addiction or suicide prevention. There's tons of trainings out there and sometimes it's just coordinating them and figuring out what training is going to be the best fit for your agency. You know, we were really honored to go down and we participated in Papa's training, the Safe Bar training. Um, and it's just another great example of a training that's out there that that is just what is going to be the best fit for your agency. So you can definitely request it so we can send you resources. Super, thank you. Um, John, there was a couple of questions uh, that popped up during your presentation. One was, do NYPD cops get a hard time about medical marijuana for PRSD from administration? I don't know that acronym, but I imagine they probably do. If you were uh, trying to answer, John, you were on mute. Sorry about that. I was having a hard time hearing you because of the, I guess there's some people that are unmuted in the background, but that's gone now. Uh, can you just repeat that question, please, Dara? 
uh, uh, so do, do NYPD cops get a hard time about medical marijuana for PRSD from admin? Right. With, with the, the internal workings of the police department, we don't get involved in any of that, so I don't know what their stance is on that, whether they're, it's permissible, not permissible, what happens. Uh, we do deal with, with, with people who have substance abuse problems, but as far as policy, that's all for directly the NYPD, their administration. Okay. Um, another question was, are there workshops or trainings with peers, for example, CPS, CPRA, and police officers available in New York City? Well, well, one of the things is is like this training that we we put together to safer again everybody's independent and uh, we do have peer training. However, that peer training is for for our internal peers. Uh, they get an eight day training, uh, which consists of many different components as far as you know looking into themselves, a bonding component, educational component. Uh, but that's something that we don't have people from the outside coming in on but we have numerous different trainings that we do on a regular basis and for the most part other than the peer training itself we always welcome uh, other agencies to to come in if we can uh you know if they're interested in coming in okay um I see that we're starting to bump up against time so um I, i'm gonna ask if it's okay for our panelists or excuse me, our presenters, there are a couple of other questions that I can make sure that we condense. If it would be okay to send those questions to you and at your uh, leisure, you may be able to respond to those and I can get them out when we do the notification about the workshop being posted, if that's okay for uh, for you, John and, and George and Katie. Um, I just wanna be respectful of folks' time. Absolutely. I have, that's just give, you can give everybody my email address, and if they have any questions or want to attend any of the trainings we're doing, uh, they can just send me an email, and I'll let them know when our our next dates are. Would that be okay, uh, George and Katie? Absolutely. All right. So, um, stop this. 